Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Raymond Patton, the faculty director of the Honors Program and Macaulay Honors College at John Jay. Welcome to the Unanswered Questions series, uh, co-sponsored by John Jay College, Macaulay Honors College, and the New York Philharmonic. Um, here, we're, we're going to address the question of the intersection of, the polit of politics and the arts, the politics of expression, with an amazing panel you'll hear about in just a moment. Um, but first, I would like to introduce my colleague, uh, Gary Padmore, Vice President of Education and Community Engagement at the New York Philharmonic. It's thanks to Gary, as well as Jeannie oliver Katara and Dean Dara Byrne, uh, that this collaboration got off the ground. So Gary, come on up. How you all doing? Wow, let's try it again. How you all doing? Still bad. Okay, no, no problem. So, um, so yeah. So my name is uh, Gary Padma. I'm the vice president of education and community engagement at the New York Philharmonic. Um, it truly, is, it is truly an honor for us to be in this space. Um, I think for the Philharmonic, we are learning on a daily basis, and um, you know, it's it's really special that we have an opportunity to learn through the arts, right? Um, we're engaging in conversations around, you know, what impacts our society, and we're using what we do as artists to, to make that possible. And so I um, really want to offer my gratitude to John Jay for really for providing the space for us to be here, um, to learn with you all, um, and, and, and really to um, interrogate and critique, in some cases, the, 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 the actions that we have. And so I hope that by the end of this, um, you know, it prompts you not only to further engage with what we do, but also to really question, you know, how uh, we as individuals can really be more, um, you know, engaged with our society and, and, and being more active in many ways. And so, so thank you all again. Um, I was told to be very short, and I am being very short here. And so without further ado, I want to, um, well, not introduce you all, but I want to pass it over to uh, Dr. President, President Dr. Carol Mason. Thank you very much, Gary. And I just realized with this setup, you might not see me. Um, good afternoon, and I'm so excited about this program. And thank you all for attending in person, and those of you who are watching um, uh, virtually, to attend this exciting Unanswered Questions panel with the New York Philharmonic and John Jay's Honors Program. Um, and I'd like to, again, say thank you to Gary for hosting us. They did this last year with a performance at the Philharmonic that was really so inspirational and informative for our students and for those of us who are, uh, work here at John Jay. I'd like to thank everyone at the Philharmonic for their valuable time and efforts um, and the hard work of the Honors Department, Ray, Adrian, um, to uh, bring us this wonderful program. And of course, our wonderfully talented students at John Jay, whose inquisitive minds, and those of you who have the cards with questions, they will ask you tough questions that I will enjoy watching you answer. Um, but they always bring inquisitive questions and perspectives to continually challenge us about creating a brighter future. Uh, this impressive panel in partnership with, with John Jay and the New York Philharmonic started about a year ago, as, as Ray mentioned earlier. John Jay was the first CUNY partner campus, uh, followed by the Macaulay Honors College and many other CUNY campuses. And I was teasing him saying, why isn't John Jay's logo up there, not just Macaulay? So for those watching, John Jay started this under the leadership of the now dean of the Macaulay Honors College. So giving you a shout out in attribution, Dara. The idea of exploring justice in all of its many dimensions sits at the foundation of John Jay's mission. And that's why, as a collective community, we contemplate fairness, equality, and diversity, not just within the realm of law and the criminal justice system, but also in fields like literature, the arts, science, and of course, music. The Unanswered Question series allows us to rethink what counts as culture, whose work gets to be heard, and who has access to that work. This group has learned how composers and creators have protested injustices through their art. And I think about the performance we la saw last year about You Have the Right to Remain Silent. You've discussed how the legacies of racism and enslavement have impacted societal standards of beauty, and you've tackled how inequitable access to mental health resources affects artists of color. Now, as we discuss the politics of expression, I'm excited to hear your honest thoughts, perspectives, and opinions throughout this, through this discussion. And as we embark on this discussion, I want us to remember the bravery of Soviet composer Dmitry Shostakovich and the black American composer William Grant Still 
Shostakovich stayed true to his art as he faced the fury of Joseph Stalin for an opera that was perceived to be too avant-garde and confusing. William Grant Still, known as the Dean of African American Composers, broke the color barrier when he became the first African American composer to have a symphony performed by a professional orchestra in the United States. The courage of these composers had is both phenomenal and replicable. It's not once in a lifetime, it's replicable by many of you watching and listening today. Each and every one of our students can use their chosen art form to express their thoughts, feelings, and concerns about the world today. And the panelists who you'll hear from in a moment include leaders and pioneers in this important work. So please listen closely to their wisdom, ask questions, and take away fresh ideas that will enrich how you listen to music and propel you forward in your journeys. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, President Mason. Thank you so much, Gary and New York Philharmonic for the invitation to moderate this exciting panel. My name is Toya Lillard. I am Executive Director of 651 Arts in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, 651 Arts is a legacy organization, 34 years old, born in Brooklyn, New York, uh, with the mission to celebrate and center black diasporic arts uh, and as you know we need that now more than ever so I'm excited to be here to moderate this panel and to ask some hard questions uh, I love the theme unanswered questions uh, so often questions go unanswered because they're hard you get left on red so we're going to address some of the questions that have been left on red <laughs> and uh, consider uh, the ways that politics and the politics of expression impact art and art making. Uh, and it's my pleasure to have some genius artists, all women, okay, um, uh, and um, to delve into some of these questions that um, have been sparked by these wonderful composers in this program that we will um, dig into. So just to situate us in why we're here, um, just want to remind us about this great panel. So the Unanswered Questions is a discussion series co-created by the New York Philharmonic, John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and Macaulay Honors College, which uses Philharmonic programming as a lens through which to examine complex issues of our time. So we're using this repertoire as a lens through which uh, we might consider how artists, composers um, of, of all uh, genres grapple with dealing, living in tough times as we live in, and dealing with the political pressures that sometimes arise uh, through the people who ask them to create art. Uh, today's panel looks at the complicated balance of expression and socio-political pressures and complements performances of works by Still and Shostakovich. We will chat with this panel um, along and um, I'm moderated by myself. As I said, I am a theater director, artist, activist, and also uh, executive director of 651 Arts. So let's get into it. Um, I'd love to introduce you to our panel before I ask our first question. Um, Elizabeth Helgeson is director of artistic planning and art administration at the New York Philharmonic. Labeled explosive by Strad Magazine, new music Music champion Helgeson is also the violist and president of the Talea Ensemble. Helgeson holds a bachelor's degree from, from Oberlin Conservatory, master's degree from Manus College, and an artist diploma from SUNY Purchase, where she was in residence with the I.O. Quartet. Uh, I am your moderator, and I've already told you about me, so we can skip over that part. Uh, Tanya Leon is a composer, a conductor, 
and an educator. Born in Havana, Cuba, Leon is highly regarded as a composer, conductor, educator, and advisor to arts organizations. Her orchestral work, Stride, commissioned by the New York Philharmonic, was awarded the 2021 Pulitzer Prize in Music. All right. Angelica Negron is a composer and educator. Puerto Rican bo born composer and multi instrumentalist, Negron writes music for accordions, robotic instruments, toys, electronics, as well as for chamber ensembles, orchestras, choir, and film. She was the recipient of the 2022 Hermitage Greenfield Prize. Give it up for our panel. Let's have a little bit more energy. Thank you. I uh, want to also welcome our virtual community to be excited about uh, these panelists and their work uh, and the ways that they've been celebrated. To that end, my first question for all of the panelists is, what are the artistic lineages that inform your work as a composer, as an artist, uh, who are some of the folks that have inspired you? Hi. Um, well, um, speaking of myself, I mean, it started with uh, my first mentors, which were the teachers at the conservatory that uh, had a tremendous fo um, hope about uh, what I demonstrated to be inclinations to be in music forever, something that my family was very, um, very nervous about it, and they told me to study something else also. So in other words, I am also a CPA, uh, not thinking that music was going to be the real thing. So um, upon my arrival in the States, you know, one of the first mentors for me was a man that actually chartered my future in a way because you know I trained to be a musician and all of a sudden I turned into a composer and a conductor and that uh, the name of that man was um, Arthur Mitchell which is uh, the founder or co-founder of the Dance Theater of Harlem and then uh, many 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 other uh, teachers composers I mean you know from Leonard Bernstein to Halo I mean Hala, uh, Halash it was his last name, and uh, to um, Ursula Mamlock, the only teacher that I had, uh, born in Germany. I mean, these are people from all, all walks of life and all parts of the world. But these are the, the ones that became the engine uh, for me to do what I do. And uh, I would like to recognize also the engine of my family and uh, also the, the hopes that they had for my future, starting with my grandmother, which was the one that took me to a conservatory when I was four years old. <laughs> Thank you, beautiful. <laughs> Roots and routes, that's the theme of this question, y'all. Well, I feel very fortunate to be sitting next to one of my biggest mentors, Tanya. Um, I feel really grateful to have been able to study with Tanya and our friendship and mentorship has evolved and continued in, in really beautiful ways after I studied with her at the Graduate Center, which is why I went to the Graduate Center. I was telling her I never finished my doctorate, but I re I, I'm really glad that I went there just because I had the experience of studying with Tanya. Um, Tanya was also someone that when I was in Puerto Rico, there was the one name that I heard that was a woman in classical music. Um, so, so her name has been around in, for a while. Um, Alfonso Fuentes was my mentor in Puerto Rico. He was a really, um, a really big influence, and I always joke that he's the Puerto Rican Tania, <laughs> and that you guys have to meet at some point because it's, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I would say similarly to Tania, also the woman in in my family. Um, I mean, my family was, has always been very supportive, but particularly just seeing um, women being so um, active in many different things and not letting themselves be in like, oh, I'm gonna just be the caregiver, or I'm just gonna be the one that does this other, like just the, the layered um, 
identities of the women around me is something that has been really inspiring. And then um, one last thing I'll mention is that I, I started making music, even though I grew up playing violin, I really started composing and making music more in the DIY scene in San Juan and, and more in in clubs and, and spaces for electronic and, and, and indie music. And there was a, a band that doesn't exist anymore called Super Aquello that um, roughly translates to Super That, but that was, I remember seeing them and, and feeling like this is one of the most Puerto Rican things I've ever seen, but also this speaks to all of the things I'm listening to now. So it's a different way of accessing my Latinidad that not necessarily was limited to what the views of how Puerto Ricans should sound or look like. It was, it was, that was a, for me, one of those moments that really changed me and that allowed me to see different ways of expressing my identity through what I do. I love the fact that you um, mentioned the intersectional lives, both of you, the, of the women that have inspired you, uh, intersectional, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary. Thank you. And I am not a composer. Um, so in terms of lineage that way, I can't necessarily speak to that. But what I can say circuitously is that I started out as a violinist. I became a violist. One thing that I that really pushed me into music professionally was that synergy between composers and and performers. And that moment of working with a composer and building relationship changes the music behind that. And I thought that was so powerful. And so now, actually, I need to update my bio. I learned that <laughs> just now. Um, I don't play anymore, but um, it's just a joy to be able to present them and to have this opportunity. Both of you have been on the season, and in Angelica's case, with two premieres already. Um, and watching the opportunity to work with the orchestra and so on is just very powerful. And so it's a joy to be part of that. Thank you. Um, thank you for being all for being so generous in uh, sharing with us your artistic lineages. Uh, roots and routes are important because we are reminded of the communities that helped shape and grow us and also the communities that we've chosen to be a part of and the people in those communities that helped shape and grow us. Uh, so thank you. Um, moving on to our next question, um, just want to reference the program uh, that uh, will be enjoyed December 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, the reason why we're here. Um, still Beethoven and Shostakovich will be on that program. Today we will be talking about still Shostakovich and Respighi as it relates to our topic. So my second question is, um, what excites you about this repertoire and these composers? If you don't mind, I'm going to take a few minutes to talk actually about, about this program. But before we get into it, I thought we could maybe do a little listening exercise. So, Jeannie. And number two. Okay, so just so you know, if you're in the hall hearing these pieces live, it's loud as heck, which is so exciting, but um, meanwhile, you'll have, to, you'll have to come to the hall. Um, those were two very different composers, but what did those two pieces have in common? What did you hear? Yeah. You could do a low budget, high budget, as you wish. But yes, it sounded very triumphant, right? What else? OK, raise of hands. Does it sound happy? Kind of? Yeah? Did it sound 
um, oppressed, mournful, no, what else did you hear? Awesome. So he's saying that the brass and the, the percussion and so on, they're loud instruments, so that helps kind of add to the monster of the machine, so to speak, right? What else? Yeah. Sorry? Parade. Parade. Oh, like a parade. Fantastic. Anything else? Okay. So the Respighi actually was the first thing you heard. And Shostakovich was the second thing. Both of these are the last movements um, of their pieces. Respighi, in this case, is the Pines of Rome. We actually opened our season with that piece. Tanya got to hear it many, many, many times in the hall through our rehearsals. Um, and so I wanted to do a little flashback. But what's fascinating about that piece is that that was written in 1924. And so if you think about what's going on in the country in 1924 in Italy, Mussolini is all about nationalistic stuff. Meanwhile, Respighi doesn't care about it, but Respighi loves Rome. He loves Rome. He's born in Bologna, but then he moved to Rome, and he's like, oh my gosh, this is so great. So he writes this piece to evoke all of the wonderful things about Rome, and this particular movement actually is a it's the Pines of the Appian Way, and it's supposed to be creating this feeling of the Roman army marching through. And so that's why you hear drums, you hear the crash, you hear, you want these big sounds that are celebratory. But Mussolini didn't want anything to do with fascism, so it, wasn't, it was celebrating the country, celebrating a culture, but not celebrating something that he didn't get behind. But... Meanwhile, there has been conversation afterwards where it's like, well, can we really appreciate this piece if it's celebrating the Roman army? I mean, uh. so there's sort of that interesting question there. Meanwhile, we move ahead to Shostakovich. The piece is written in the 60s. And I, do you know anything about Shostakovich? Yeah, sort of, no. So Dmitry Shostakovich was one of the composers who stayed in, in Russia, but... He, he was forced to convert to communism. He tried to avoid it. He was anti-communism, but in order to basically save his life, he converted. And so he ended up creating all of this art that was not in support of communism, but actually sort of subverting it and, and making fun of it. And it was his message on, to the outside world. This piece actually is an interesting piece, and it's not played often because it's called the year... Uh, 1917, which was the Russian Revolution. And it's a programmatic piece, so it's also evoking something, but more specifically, uh, like, events that happened. And this movement is actually called the... Mm, wrote it down. Um, oh, get ready for this. The Dawn of Humanity. How wild is that? It's so, it sounds so huge. So anyway, it's it, there's something very interesting in this where he actually wrote this and dedicated it to Lenin. And I think we all kind of feel like, eh, eh, really? But he wasn't Stalin. And so there are some questions about, can we still be OK with this? But then there are also questions about, but was he actually being sarcastic even with that? So there's, there are some unanswered things there. Both celebratory. Shostakovich's language is much more stark than the Respighi, which is maybe more ornate within. Um, but then, anyway, so you won't hear the Respighi in this concert, but if you see it on a bill, definitely buy tickets. Um, but the Shostakovich will be there, and at the beginning of the concert, we start with William Grant Still, who was prolific. He wrote so many pieces, all incredibly beautiful, and embracing all kinds of things around him, and his language involves jazz, it involves his heritage, and... Um, and it has a very classical structure, too. Um, and he, I think the interesting thing about him is he has been in the history books ever since he's been around. He, that has never gone away, but he hasn't been played until very recently. And that's been incredibly unfortunate. And so now it's just such a joy to be 
kind of bringing him back to life in a way and be presenting him and in these powerful pieces. Darker America is also a tone poem. It's not programmatic about events, but we hear the sense of, um, well, he says it's evoking sorrow and hope and a prayer. So you can kind of hear those feelings throughout it. Um, so anyway, those are kind of, you know, we talked about how a culture will create a voice and then the voice can be um, propagated through that culture or not. And so it's sort of on us as presenters, as artists, to make sure that voices aren't lost to history. So anyway, I'll turn it over. Thank you so much for that uh, that education and, and for all of that context uh, regarding not just the repertoire, but the composers. Uh, noticing the time and place uh, where our composers were born, uh, particularly William Grant Still, thinking about Mississippi in the late 1800s, the turn of the century, and what was happening then and there, uh, and the importance of having context, of understanding how difficult it had to have been for him to emerge as a prolific composer at that time, uh, given the circumstances that he undoubtedly had to face. Thinking about uh, each of the composers, when and where they were born, and what was happening at the time uh, is important. So my question to our composers uh, is, um, lack of context can provoke and fuel dissent, uh, sometimes dissent that folks don't know, <laughs> you know, sort of where it comes from. Um, what is the importance of holding space for dialogue to address dissent intent and context as it relates to um, addressing these hard questions through art? Um, I mean, I think as an educator, uh, that's one of the things that I feel uh, is it's such a wonderful opportunity to engage in conversations around the works rather than just, um, I think it's separate from the conversation of them standing alone, sure, but then, but of course context and and sparking conversations, that's really what's, it, what's about, right? Um, and I think as a composer, I when I write something, I don't really care so much if someone likes it or not, but if it moved something, if it sparked a conversation, if it, shook you up or if it, if it does something that's the main thing um and a lot of things need context or i think there's there's just so much um that gets lost if there's not an opportunity for engaging with people and also to hear how the context is also resonating with others too because um, depending on your lived experience, where you come from, you might have a very different reaction um, based on your lived experience to to what you're hearing. And a lot of what we need for that, I feel that we need more um, in general is to hearing how someone else reacts to something and how they're seeing it. It's one of the, one of the wonderful things about art, obviously, and, and music that is so abstract too, is that. You know, there could be so many entry points and so many different ways of interpreting something and in things that are so specifically rooted in something that's an event or uh, that it has a programmatic element to it. There is also that, um, there is there is a static part of it that feels like it's, it's about this thing, but it's never just about that. So what I'm more interested in is the conversation with others about what, it is, what does that mean for you? Exciting to think about what Beth referenced, the subversive messages. Yeah, uh, Shostakovich wasn't necessarily down with uh, 
communism uh, and uh, found a way to express that. Uh, we know that in the American South, uh, enslaved folks found ways to insert subversive messages in their music, in work songs uh, that were formerly called slave songs. It turned into uh, spirituals so that a song like Swing Low Sweet Chariot ain't about <laughs> you know, um, dying and going to heaven. It's actually giving instructions to run away, follow the drinking gourd. The list goes on. You can look it up. Um, but context uh, gives us the opportunity to receive messages that may not be intended for everyone. We learned that from Shostakovich and Still, and hope that you may be inspired uh, to find ways to communicate um, messages to folks that are similarly situated? Yes, um, composers, like every artist, um, describe in a way what is happening in their times. And uh, these composers did it in their own way, and now we listen to the music. The music might not sound as fresh as when it was premiered, you know, because, I mean, many, many pieces have been actually uh, written uh, as models of these pieces. So therefore, that's why to feel uh, that it sound heroic, or it sounds like a march, or it sounds like that, is something that composers have done throughout the centuries. But uh, it's very interesting to see how composers hide under their works, you know, their true word. And um, that goes from grand still, because I mean, most of these melodies are colored and imbued by the music of the American of African descent. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you find it there. I mean, it's, it's there, it's overt, it's not hidden, but at that time, in a way, was an affront to what was happening, mm. you see? And that happens to all of these composers. I mean, we haven't talked about Beethoven, that is going to be part of the program, but Beethoven did the same thing by writing the Eroica. At first, he was actually admiring Napoleon, and by the time of the end of the piece, he was against Napoleon completely, you see? So, I mean, composers and artists and poets and writers and people in the arts, because, I mean, is in a way abstract, you see? Words can be abstract also, and words have a lot of power. Same thing with sound. Sound can be in the abstract, and sound has a lot of power. And now we know more about Shostakovich after he died, because his son is the one that disclosed how many of these pieces were against communism, as opposed to, you know, being a soldier of whatever he was told to do. So, I mean, I think that that is something uh, fantastic that the arts is actually giving the artist a way to speak in ways that actually transcend generations because we are discussing pieces that now are, you know, more than 50 years old. I mean, you know, so therefore, I mean, and that, that goes throughout history, you know, I mean, go to Plato, go to Socrates, to go, I mean, same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just want to add a quick um, anecdote. I, um, when I grew up in Puerto Rico playing violin, I I was not aware of contemporary music at all or living composers. The, my entry point to that was Shostakovich, who was long gone by then. But just I remember there was a colleague of mine that um, he was a really good violinist, and he was for a competition. He was doing the first violin concerto, so he was rehearsing that. So I would stalk him outside of the of the of his practice room just to hear it because I had never heard something like that. And I had no context for anything Shostakovich. Um, and I was also in very different, you know, I was in a Caribbean island and just this, but this sounded to me like he was making fun of something and that captured my attention. And then I heard the orchestra part and I was like, this is so cool. Cause I, I mean, I grew up playing in orchestras and I, it has a sound, right? And this made me listen to it differently, and that sparked my curiosity. So um, I, it just makes me think that, you know, of course, th there's a huge importance in context too. But I think one of the other, the other side that also it's not, it's not one; it's mutually exclusive. They live beautifully together. I think it's that the music and art has the power to. There's a sensibility that communicates and transcends also something that is more literal. 
And now I'm putting all this context to that experience, right, that I had as a 20 year old. But, um, but there is something there that appeals to, to curiosity that can then be layered with context and then form something else. Leading with curiosity that Shostakovich could not have known that he would be inspiring a little girl in Puerto Rico, <laughs> right? But that leading with curiosity allows you to create art that is timeless, that can speak to so many in places where you may never go across time. That's, that's really beautiful. Well, and I think, um, I, I read your comments from a few days ago, I think, and they're amazing, by the way. They were so fantastic, and I was getting goosebumps. And you were hitting the nail on the head in terms of Shostakovich could have defected. He could have left his country, but maybe the power was that he stayed there, and he, you know, how many journalists it doesn't end up well if they decide to speak their truth? But with music, you can you can speak your truth. There's that element. And then, like Tanya was saying, that power, the and, and Angelica, like, the way that it sort of gets into your brain the way it affects our brain chemistry actually can bring people along like this music makes movements music makes movements it's actually factual you can look it up <laughs> music uh has been a part of every uh social movement known to man there has never been a movement without music uh so as the kids say facts um, fourth question here, relationships, interactions that composers and artists have with commissioning groups and individuals can impact the resulting work and or the artistic process, as we've seen uh, with the composers that we've discussed. Um, can each of you talk about how a relationship with a commissioning group or individual has impacted you? What, what you're safe to share comfortably, of course. <laughs> um, okay, I will talk about um, Stride at the New York Philharmonic. I was approached uh, by the New York Philharmonic um, and uh, to write a piece that would celebrate the 19th Amendment. To tell you the truth, I didn't know anything about the 19th Amendment. You know, I was sent to the to the library to the to me, Google, you know, <laughs> to find out about the 19th Amendment, and that is how I discover uh, Susan B. Anthony, which was actually the person that spearheaded it, the, the the whole thing and the question about women and the right of voting. You have to understand that at the beginning of last century or two centuries ago, whichever century, women didn't have the the right to cast a vote in general in a country. And uh, that was happening in the United States as well. So there was a woman that actually thought about it and with such a passion that she then ignited that passion in many women. And uh, as she did, they marched on with petition to Congress, to the government about this for, for to be legislated and for this to pass. So nowadays, we vote. I'm a woman that goes and vote. But that was a person that made that happen. And that, thanks to this commission, I was able to find out that point of history in this nation that it was something that I had not delved into. And not because I didn't want to turn to know, but I mean, how many things can you do at the same time and my primary education was in the island of Cuba, so this is something that I didn't know. So based on that, I wrote this piece dedicated to her and dedicated to women of my family that I felt that actually were marked with the same spirit of resilience. And um, the rest is history. And one of the things that I can tell about the piece is that the very same march that I felt um, with this woman and the power of all these women together asking for something that it was their right as a human being. Um, I actually connected with another march that upon my arrival in the United States, I saw for the first time in television 
and it was the marches of Martin Luther King. He was alive, and that impressed and created such a such an impetus in my mind, you know, that that to this day I still remember that moment. So I connected both that march, the first one that I saw, and the one that I imagined of all these women going and asking for the right that nowadays we enjoy. And that is something that went into the piece at a given moment when I felt that that was what I heard in my mind. And to this day, I still, when I hear the piece, that is actually the moment that touches me in my own piece, thinking that this came out of something that was in my heart that I didn't know was going to be part of that. So that, that, that tells you about uh, composers actually uh, imbuing their pieces with something that sometimes is a secret and then is given to an audience for an audience to react in whichever, in whichever way. And in closing, I would like to say that, for example, this happens in all forms and all genres of music. And we can actually think about John Lennon and that incredible piece called Imagine, you see? Because the thing is that it's something that transcend centuries. And that piece will be like these pieces, pieces that are going to talk about what was happening and what we dream of, which is something that we can actually put in a piece of music as well. Thank you for that. Um, and thank you for referencing two important um, historical moments in this country, the women's suffrage movement and the civil rights movement. Uh, I would be remiss not to mention uh, intersectionality, yeah? Uh, and the intersectional um, aspects of both of these movements with the women's suffrage movement um, that was led by Susan B. Anthony. Uh, there were many women of many races that participated and marched and fought for women's suffrage. Um, and I would be remiss not to note that um, not all of those women got to vote <laughs> in 1919. Um, so for example, you and I wouldn't be turned away <laughs> in 1919. We had to wait till the civil rights movement, uh, which gave black folks the right to vote, specifically the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So we want to, again, context is so important. Uh, I grew up thinking that in, you know, after the, the 19th Amendment was passed, all women could just march up and vote. And I just had this thought, of, you know, image in my head that was never corrected until, you know, I sought out the information and parsed it out for myself. So yeah, um, context, particularly when we're dealing with the history uh, of this country is so important. <laughs> One thing that I want to actually add is that the end of that piece that I described, that I wrote for the Philharmonic, ends precisely with that comment. Because at the end of the piece, you know, what I decided to do based on the fact that the women of color still didn't have actually the actualization of what had happened, uh, the piece ends with a pattern based on a clave, which is a concept that we will discuss in the future, that had to do with a clave of the Africans, Africans from Africa, you know? And it's a pattern that actually recurs as a, another march, you know, that actually goes into infinite, because, I mean, it disappears, but as something that still needed to be actually um, be part of the whole, the global attitude of voting, which at the time was not possible yet. Thank you for that. The global attitude, remembering that these issues are global, not just here. Thank you, that was beautiful. Yeah, I mean, um, thinking about voting also makes me think also of people that are greatly affected by um, decisions that the US makes but that aren't able to vote for the president of the United States, like Puerto Ricans. Um, I'm able to vote because I live here, but Puerto Ricans on the island are not able to vote. Um, we have representation in Congress, but that's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's a little bit of a joke. Um, I think for 
like for me this makes me think of I've, I think I've struggled even since I was in Puerto Rico to struggle to find my identity and like how to bring in my Puerto Ricanidad and my Latinidad into my music and I've always felt a little pressure of like I have to bring in these things or put some seasoning here and there and make it <laughs> more Caribbean and um, and actually studying with Tanya was really eye-opening in that too because you know it's one of the many things that you do so well, right? It's bring your whole self in it in a very authentic way. Um, but I feel like whenever I, and I think with you even, I tried some experiments and and using some Afro-Caribbean things from Bomba and Plena and it just did not feel right for me. I felt like I was appropriating my own mm. <laughs> culture. Um, and then I, I wrote this piece for the Bangana Kind of Ulsters that was an open commission, no prompt or anything. And I ended up sampling Los Pleneros de la 21, their, um, their Bomba and Plena group. Um, and I sampled a little bit of, of one of the songs, and but it, it is a sample from a clip from Sesame Street. And that felt right. Like th that distance of, and, and also commenting on the gay, and like these Pleneros are here, but there's, it's from the gaze of the other that's watching it. And it's also in the electronics in the piece, it's manipulated. That felt true to myself. And it's a piece called Turistas that is also very much commenting on the tourism industry in Puerto Rico and how that intersects with disaster capitalism um, and, and all the really terrible things that are happening there. Um, but that was something that came very just like natural for me. Um, that just makes me think of, I think, and and in new commissions sometimes, and now there's all this talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we're being invited more and more in those spaces, and then there are people that are still catching up and are, are doing many, like skipping many steps, and sometimes I've gotten prompts for commissions that are connected directly to my trauma, mm. which is not something that necessarily happens to white male composers, right? I, um, and. So I, I was asked to write a piece about Hurricane Maria right after that happened by a few organizations. Um, and I think whenever those pieces happen and exist in the world, they have to come from the creator. Um, that organizations have to be very careful about that. Um, but as uh, as Tanya also mentioned for Stride, it's there's it's if I'll, if I love a focused thing too, and I, when a prompt is open enough and focused at the same time it's it's really an invitation for the creator and for the audience to like zoom into something and i those are for me the the most meaningful experiences to um i'm i'm finishing up a piece finishing it's coming gary <laughs> um <laughs> a, a piece for the near philharmonic for a young people's concert um and it's in partnership with el puente and a mural they did um a really gorgeous mural that is centered around the Dia de los Muertos, but mostly on the on the theme of loss and grief, and also intersection of environmental justice with with disaster capitalism. Um, I know a lot through the lens of of Puerto Rico too. That most of the students now this is in Los Sures, so a lot of um, of them have personal connections to that. And I've been visiting their their classes, seeing them build things, record them using those sounds in the piece. And this was a very specific commission from the New York You're gonna partner with El Puente. And I think if it came from another organization, I would have felt like, oh, you want me to write a piece about a, so, and something environmental justice and I'm Puerto Rican and, and it's with this group that is mostly Latinx. I would have been a little hesitant, but it, with New York Phil, I was a teaching artist with them for many years. I worked with El Puente. It, they, it's thoughtful. Mm. It's, there's intention and thought behind it that not only speaks to my identity, but also that they really know the work I do. I do a lot of work with electronics and plants. It makes sense. So I think more of that thoughtfulness behind the programming is something that I'm hoping for as, we, um, as we're hearing from different voices and being trying to be more inclusive or of people that are invited into these spaces that historically have excluded us. It's also then when you have us there, what are the conditions that we're given so that we can thrive and not only be invited? Wow, you make me think of, um, firstly, the ways that folks bypass engaging with 
the communities that they say they care about and want to create art about. I think about Leonard Bernstein famously saying that he'd never met a Puerto Rican. And you wrote a whole, wait, what? Never met a Puerto Rican person, um, but was somehow inspired to create West Side Story without talking to just one? Still, as someone that isn't a Puerto Rican in classical music, it's the first thing that a lot of people tell me. And so there we go. So again, context, yeah? So um, creating a piece in a vacuum without asking the very people, we could, we could go back to the Gershwin to Porgy, but we won't, we don't have time for that. Let's just focus on Bernstein. Um, when, what, 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 you know, uh, would he have engaged with an El Puente? Should he have? Uh, we don't need to answer that question. Those questions can go unanswered. But context, um, intent, uh, impact. What is the impact of not having cultural literacy or context for the folk that you're writing about? What happens when the person, the artist creating the work of art has context and connection to community. Y'all could have wrote West Side Story then. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I have an idea, but I don't know if, I will, I, and if I'll ever be able to, <laughs> this piece I have in my head, but it has to do a lot with reclaiming West Side right, Story. Exactly, because should it have been? <laughs> Hi, Facebook community. Um, but you know, um, it begs the question of representation and uh, we think about the dearth of representation uh, in classical music, in the arts particularly, and who gets to tell the stories? Who gets to tell the stories? And who do we trust? Um, no one questioned uh, the authenticity of West Side Story, even though uh, for many years, uh, Puerto Ricans bristled and said, that's not right, that's not a real representation, that's not how we, sp that's not, hey, wait a minute, what? Um, so it's an internal core value question um, of our time. Uh, how do we wish to move forward with intent, uh, understanding the impact of lack of cultural literacy. All right, well then. <laughs> um, we have some questions from the audience that we have some time for. Um, you've been writing on your note cards, I see. I see you, you are seen. Um, we want to also notice and note that there were some comments uh, that were submitted through Padlet that uh, I will, throughout our conversation, um, pepper the conversation with these wonderfully rich comments. Wanna thank you all for your intentionality in terms of um, submitting comments beforehand and also scribing questions as we have uh, gone through the panel today. So questions for our panelists. First two. Um, we didn't get to hear the William Grant Still excerpt. Can we hear it? I'm curious how it compares with the triumphant sound of the other two. Thank you, question. I didn't mean to be so loud. What do you think? 
Doesn't exactly sound like a Roman army. No. <laughs> Not exactly triumphant. Um, I feel the blues. <laughs> Mournful. Thank you for that question, um, because otherwise we wouldn't have heard the difference between the two. Thank you so much. Um, uh, the second question here for now is, what are your big picture ideas for networking and community building through artistic activism? Uh, you talked about your project uh, with El Puente. Uh, what are some other ideas for uh, community building through your artistic activism? Well, two things come to mind. One is the New York Philharmonic bandwagon initiative. And I'm not just saying that because we're here with the Phil and I worked at the Phil for a while, but it, it really is what I wish to see more of. I see a lot of like, we're coming into the community and teaching you about classical music and educating you. And there's already a really vibrant community of music happening there that needs to be celebrated and not be kind of ignored. It's, um, so I think the more cultural organizations realize that and, and come to their community, to those communities with a, with humble, with humility and, and just like what's happening here, let's put it in conversation with what we're doing and not so that it doesn't feel like, you know, this is, there's levels to it or, or, or judgment. I think that that's a really great opportunity for, um, for people to ex just experience awesome programming mm -hmm. and also for, for people to feel invited also into the hall and or whatever other space the music is happening. Um, and that also makes me think of the importance of, of concerts that are beyond the hall too. Um, and band, bandwagon was literally just going to places. So um, that was very out, like just out in, in the world with people, but also just like what are places that are important in a community, um, a park, a botanical garden and what happens when you expand the containers that music is often performed at? Um, I I had a, a piece of a few years ago, three years ago at the New York Botanical Garden, a site-specific installation um, in the forest, and with a hundred voices in electronics, and and my mom came to that, and I think it's the it is the moment that she actually understood what I did. And she's been to many of my concerts, been supportive, applauded, because everyone's applauding. And it's, but I think seeing people talking while the piece was happening, shuffling leaves because they were invited to as part of the piece, um, hearing kids tell their parents something about, it, just seeing it alive out in the world, that's, I, I want more of that. Um, and then I think on another level that feels a little maybe more local in terms of arts, I think um, there's a lot of conversations about inviting people that make music in different ways into the classical music. Um, and there's obviously the barrier of notation, because, and that's just one way in which you make music is writing it down, right? But I'm sure some of you here make music in different ways too. I make a lot of my music not on the paper. Um, so I think it's also important to be really, to, for organizations and, and major orchestras to also be aware of the work that needs to be done so that those people are invited into those spaces too. And it's not just like, oh, it's we're gonna put a collaboration between a classical composer and a DJ, sure. But what if the DJ has been wanting to write a piece for orchestra or for woodwinds or like, what does that process look like what does the support for that looks like that I'm interested in that so that more voices are invited in but they also feel like they have the support and it's not a one-off and it's like oh yeah that's not for me I'm just gonna go back to my laptop mm -hmm. um, yeah yeah important to invite voices in but also go out to where those voices reside and live and commune and build community otherwise it's transactional and we know that a lot of diversity and inclusion efforts are feeling transactional because there is a reticence 
or a resistance to real community building. Why? Because that takes time and like maybe money and oh gosh, can't we just do a workshop? Get a certificate? Workshops of <laughs> many things. Right. And so when, when it comes to art making, um, yeah, it's not just the workshop. You have to actually do the thing, the, the building of the community in order for um, your art and activism, as you all called it, to be truly impactful. Wow. Um, look at these questions. We got to move on. Um, question for anyone on the panel. What does the future of composing and music look like for you? Well, um, I would like to backtrack a little bit because, I mean, uh, the fragment that we heard about uh, Grand Steel, um, it was sort of like question and answer. Um, I don't know if you remember, right? That was actually, you know. And then um, there was a space, and then there was some sort of like, something unrelated, and then a space again, and then the melody came back. And you know, and that is something that has to do actually with the culture of, of Africans, and, and I always say Americans of African descent, and that actually comes from that era where things actually translated and became then spirituals. So therefore, I mean, right there from the very beginning, you can hear that he is quoting something that at the time was not actually prevalent in the music that was written for orchestra. But uh, going about what is the future of, of music and composers, well, you have to understand that uh, the advent of the um, media and uh, media platforms and Google and everything that is happening in the world have made the world dialogue for the first time, perhaps, in centuries. Because nowadays, you might go to the Philharmonic and, and listen to a composer that have included in their music uh, uh, a pipa. And a pipa is an instrument that comes from China. You see? And in many, many years ago, when um, I think that it was, um, Oh my God. Well, I'm not going to go into that right now, but, but um, the first advent of the saxophone in the orchestra, I, actually it created a big uproar because I mean, the instruments of the orchestra didn't include saxophone, you see? So the composer that actually brought that saxophone voice into the orchestra created um, a, a tremendous uh, dialogue of, uh, the, uh, of criticism, in a way, because it was an advent. And I think that it had to do with Prokofiev or some, um, you know, I, I, I think so, but I don't know, I might be wrong. And the thing is that the same thing is happening now that we are seeing, you know, the percussionists, which are now the curators of the percussion of the world, they are including Dumbeck next to a bass drum. Mm you see, or, 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 or a djembe, mm -hmm. for example, to create a palette of colors that was not actually included before. And this is coming from the conversation among musicians, among composers and creators of many cultures in the world. And that's what I'm trying to say, that the music that is happening right now is not only inclusion because of the way that we look like, mm -hmm. but it has to do with, as I mentioned, you know, whether we like it or not, this is the only one planet in the middle of nowhere. And the thing is that we have all of these cultures created by humanity that actually talk about who they are, the identity that they have created, and the music that they have created. I remember going to China and, and facing the Peking Opera which is something that I never heard in my life, and specifically live. And I was just like, oh my God, this is something that I have never heard before. And, and, and I think that I have been in music all my life, and, and, and this happened only about a decade ago. So therefore, I mean, you know, the music that is being programmed now is like the program that my music happened to be a couple of weeks ago. There were three living composers 
three living composers. It's the first time that an orchestra dares to do something like that. Mm. Three living composers, and then Respighi. <laughs> you see, and that is, and the three of us, very different from each other. And this is actually what is happening now, and, and I, I welcome and embrace the New York Philharmonic for making that step mm. to bring in the new in all aspects, because if you go to the performances in the studio, the space called the studio, you're going to also witness many, many, many composers that are going to look like anybody, and actually with music created, or I mean, what they have created is very dissimilar from each other. So it's the first time that I, co I continually talk about the word dialogue. It's a dialogue of cultures, a dialogue of, of, of the, the creators of our time. And hopefully, I mean, some of you might be enticed to, to even think about composition as a, as a vehicle for you to speak. So beautiful that diversity is not about skin color in a room and representation, that culture changes when the texture of what is created by those diverse voices in the room, uh, when they are allowed and freed up to fully express themselves. So you're gonna hear some clave and some djembe. And that means that the question that you, what is the future of, the, of, of music? It has to do with the people making it and whether or not they feel free. That was so beautiful. Uh, and so the inspiration for us is one, get free, <laughs> and two, uh, make art that's truly reflective of who you are, not necessarily um, uh, the folks that are around you. Beautiful. Uh, we, I was given the 10 minute mark five minutes ago. Okay. Um, this is a question for Angelica, uh, the lovely composer with the purple hair. That's you. Um, Puerto Rico is a small, misunderstood island with an ever changing infrastructure. And so coming to the States and succeeding in your field can also be quite lonely at times. What has your experience been like as a Puerto Rican woman in a predominantly white space? from a fellow Puerto Rican. Um, I mean, it's, I'm still finding, to be honest, I'm still finding my place and and, um, and seeing how I navigate these spaces. I primarily, I think the orchestral one has been challenging. So I think in chamber and in, in smaller, more experimental settings, I felt very comfortable um, and there's, more opportunities for dialogue too and one-on-one, -on -one. but when I'm in a space and then there's, I'm there for just like my rehearsal and it's this huge orchestra in front of me and I'm very intimidated by it all. And also, yeah, just it's not a place that has been welcoming to people like me before. So, um, and there's also power dynamics embedded in the institution too. Um, and also culturally, as a Latina, I've been conditioned to stay small too and to not speak up so much. So that's another thing that comes into play. So it's been a lot of like being really like hyper aware of those things and really tapping into, I think, well, I hate to use the word resilience when talking about Puerto Ricans because I think we're very resilient people, but certainly we deserve better. Um, but there is something about the way we use humor, irreverence, as a form of resistance mm. and resilience. And so I like to play with that. And I like to bring that into my pieces. I like to, um, to have moments that feel a little uncomfortable for the players, but in a way that just, it's, it's bringing, it's making space for, that as a, I like to not pretend that I know I have all the answers. I like to put it in the forefront that, you know, I'm just figuring things out and also that the that there's space for humor and that there's space for humor and dark comedy and all, and all those things to also speak to things that are really hard. Mm. And that's a lot of what we do as Puerto Ricans. It's, um, so for me, it's, been bringing that into my music and into those spaces. Thank you for that. Yes. 
Yes, I would like to say something because I mean, I mean, you know, uh, de un pájaro las dos alas. Do you know about that? Well, okay, that is what is said about Puerto Rico and Cuba. We are both islands in the Caribbean, so we are Caribeñas. And the thing is that um, the thing is that I think that what we have to think is that we are more than Caribeñas. We are members. I keep saying that we are members of the same planet. You see, so therefore, I mean, to actually come from that part of that region of the world makes no difference about coming from another part of the region of the world. And that the work that we do, you know, I myself, I, I write a symphony, but I also write a salsa piece, you see, because I can adore Stravinsky, but I love dancing salsa, and I am not going to stop dancing salsa because I am writing something for the symphony orchestra. So, I mean, that's the scene. So that, that is a part of what our identity is. We are fluid, I mean, as human beings. And the same way that you might feel for Puerto Rico, I might feel for Cuba, now I feel for the United States because I have been here for such a long time. You know, I can go and live in Japan and then feel Japanese and then uh, end up in Turkey and, 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 and feel Turkish. So, I mean, in other words, I mean, we have that possibility as humans of, of integrate everything, you know, because we absorb and we absorb and we absorb. And nowadays we only SEO and that is Korean. So in other words, I mean, that, that is what, what we are actually bringing uh, to the fore. So I just wanted to say about the, our sisterhood, you know, uh, because we come from the same region of the world. That's beautiful. Um, we only have time for one more question. Um, so I want to thank you all for uh, ascribing such great questions. And I've um, endeavored to boil um, these questions down to one. Uh, we've just lived through an election, OK? And um, Gen Z came out and represented more than ever. Uh, and there's a future ahead of us that's going to be very different. And we are living still in a, 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 a pandemic, a panini, a, a, a panna cotta. Um, where and how do you find joy? Um, nowadays during these times uh, in your um, positionings, uh, where is, where do you and how do you find joy? You talked about salsa dancing, which I love, but where, how else are you finding joy these days? And that's for everyone. Um, well, certainly I feel like engaging with music every day is a privilege. And that to begin with is, um, that's pure joy. But engaging with music means engaging with creativity, engaging with curiosity, engaging with growth day to day. And so I think that sense of trajectory just kind of creates a, a feeling of optimism. Um, so, yeah. Um, I think a lot of the times in community and in yeah, and, and just kind of remembering that I come from, from a place that's very special and it's a, it's a very confused place. It's also a very special place with many um, roots that go in many places and that in the diaspora we have a beautiful community. Um, I organized a few weeks ago, along with some close friends, a benefit for Puerto Rico, and it's in a small queer club in, in Brooklyn, common everybody, and I curated the lineup. I was very proud that I booked every artist, and I've, I haven't felt that joy in such a while. I was, it was a, like from 5 p.m. till 10, and I was like, oh, this feels like my quinceanera. Because <laughs> it, it just, there was, I was just like, that these people are here, that these artists are, that I, that are connecting to each other, and now like they're gonna, I, now I hear that this person is gonna invite this other person into a music video or into a song, or this is gonna collaborate with this poet or with this um, stand up comedian. It, just like those connections, seeing them happening, seeing the, the sense of community and also, I mean, the most important thing, and that was like that they were all donating their art there for um, helping Puerto Rico. So just that, those are the things that really 
keep me grounded and that and that bring me joy. I'm I'm, I'm meaning simple. Um, the moment being here, uh, this is something that um, whether I like it or not, I am going to have things to think about about what happened today. So therefore, and sometimes, you know, I mean, thinking of the moment is like taking a mental picture. And uh, I don't know, I might be um, in the grocery store or driving home or something like that. And all of a sudden, I get a flash of all of you in my mind, you know, because I mean, it's what this moment created inside of me. So that is actually what uh, brings me joy, uh, trying to um, be present in each moment and not be there and then be thinking about something else you know but that that's, uh, that's mm. music connecting to community full presence uh i hope that you've been inspired by this conversation that some of your unanswered questions have been addressed and that you leave here inspired to do something differently uh to leave a legacy for someone else to create something that may speak to someone that you don't know in a place that you've never been. It's been my pleasure to moderate this conversation. Thank you all. Go forth and be brilliant. <laughs>